I'm pleased to be on, uh, on this uh, web seminar series. And uh, I'll be talking about mathematical neuroscience. I've been asked to talk about mathematical neuroscience and uh, this is going to be a personal perspective, of course. Uh, this is the outline of my presentation. I'll start with, of course, an introduction. Then I'll discuss the uh, pioneering work of uh, Hodgkin and Huxley. Uh, and then I'll describe the way to get these uh, equations that they got ab initio from first principles. Then I'll talk about uh, two things uh, which are maybe not as well known to the community as neurons, uh, uh, interaction, effaptic interactions between neurons and glial cells, uh, Christophe Cousa, reminded me a few months ago that they were not neurons. Uh, and I'll conclude. So let's start with the introduction. Uh, you've oh, probably most of you have seen these uh, pictures of the hierarchy and complexity in the uh, central nervous, uh, nervous system. So it starts from the, so the coarsest scale, uh, the whole central nervous, uh, nervous, nervous system uh, with a spatial scale of one meter. And then we go to systems like like here. This is uh, an artist view of uh, the uh, the visual system in uh, man and monkeys. And uh, you see, it's a very complicated. Different cortical areas are connected. It's a, a very complicated graph. Then we can talk about maps. Maps. Uh, so you see the, the the spatial scale decrease on the left hand side. So maps here you have a a view uh, obtained from uh, optical imaging of the V1. Uh, we're measuring uh, uh, sensitivity to um, visual orientations. Then we go to networks, uh, smaller sets of neurons, neurons themselves, like this one, and then the connections between the neurons, uh, synapses, where molecules and uh, yeah, molecules play an important role. So we go from the angstrom scale to the one meter scale. And in, in time, uh, it's, it's also very large uh, from uh, micro microseconds uh, uh, to uh, years uh, for the whole life of an individual. So uh, I've uh, jotted down a few, uh, a few ideas about uh, the differences between the viewpoints of biologists, physicists and mathematicians. So one way to uh, to describe this these differences is to talk about induction and deduction. Uh, induction is when you uh, you collect different facts and uh, build new ones from uh, from this collection. So we induce something new from uh, existing evidence. And deduction is uh, when you do some sort of uh, logical uh, reasoning from uh, these collected facts and deduce uh, also something else. So this might be subject to uh, criticisms, uh, probably it will, uh, but my, my, my feeling is that biologists, uh, of course, they make observations, they make measurements, and they now uh, run huge computation, perhaps huge computation models on, on data. And their work uh, seems to be more induction-based than uh, deduction-based. Again, this is this could be uh, subject to criticisms. Physicists, uh, which are also part of the game in uh, in neuroscience, uh, well, they do develop computational models for from the equations they derive. They make simulations. They rarely provide proofs. And uh, their, 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 their talent is to discover what happens in a system, physical or biological, with some reasonable uh, certainty, uh, but without you know, being absolutely sure with the proof. So I see their work more deductive than uh, inductive. Mathematicians uh, attempt to prove uh, rigorous proofs of uh, to provide, sorry, to provide uh, proofs of uh, what they work with. Uh, it might be very frustrating. It happened to me, it may happen to uh, other colleagues uh, around the cameras. Uh, sometimes uh, they provide proofs of results that are known, quote, end of quote, by another community, i.e. Uh, e.g. the uh, biologists. And uh, providing such proofs is, can be very, very difficult when uh, 
when these results bear upon situations which are considered easy by the physicist or the biologist. I, I have here in mind the uh, things I won't have time to talk about, uh, mean field uh, things, mean field uh, results, where this is a typical example where physicists uh, think that some results are obvious uh, and mathematicians, it took them 20 years or even more to actually prove that they were correct. So this can be very, very, very frustrating. Uh, so for mathematician, to me, the emphasis is more on deduction than on induction, sorry. But of course, induction plays a role in mathematical proofs, as we all know after reading, for example, uh, Poincaré. So uh, predictive mathematical models for neuroscience. Uh, we might say that the goal of mathematical neuroscience is to develop predictive, we have to make predictions, falsifiable pieces of mathematics. The word uh, falsifiable was not invented by, was, uh, was popularized by Karl Popper, a uh, British uh, philosopher of science, uh, whose picture you can see on the right hand side of your screen. Uh, he introduced the the, the the fact that in order for a theory to be scientific it has to be falsifiable namely you can find experiments or facts that uh, prove it uh, wrong he gave two examples if i remember correctly of theories which were not to him falsifiable uh, the first one was uh, psychoanalysis uh, uh, sigmund freud uh, and the second one was uh, marxism Karl Marx. Um, again, this is this is this has been subject to strong criticism. Uh, so we have to bear in mind that in neuroscience and in biology in general, all models, all mathematical models, are at least partially wrong. Okay, so uh, in, in math, uh, in uh, in uh, neuroscience, uh, what we try and do is to, uh, but I'll say more about this uh, later at the end of the talk. We try to prove rigorously uh, facts uh, since uh, and to, to help circumscribe the domain of validity of models. We'll, we'll see many examples of that, uh, the models, uh, knowing uh, that models are partially wrong. So subscribe the domain of validity, that's important. So the, uh, the first example I will take in this uh, presentation is the work of uh, Hodgkin and Huxley, uh, which is probably most familiar to uh, many of you. And uh, one of the most uh, famous mathematical model is that of uh, these two fellows you see the picture of uh, on the screen, Hodgkin and Huxley, 1952, they're one of their uh, uh, major papers, and they got Nobel Prize very uh, quickly after that in 1961. Uh, their model is for, as we'll see, um, the way an axon reacts to changes in uh, voltage variations. The models are has been falsified in the sense of Popper. Uh, some of its predictions are incorrect, as suggested, as stated by Hodgkin and Huxley in their night, one of their 1952 papers. And you can so also find uh, details in the book by Jane Cronin. Cronin, Cronin, Cronin. Uh, but the model is valid for a large number of experimental conditions. So I'll spend some time on the model now. This is a figure which is uh, taken right out of the 1952 paper by Hutchin and Huxley. It represents uh, the axon. You, you remember they worked on the uh, axon of a giant squid. Uh, <clears throat> and this represents the axon. This is the outside. This is the inside. And uh, the, basically, their representation of the axon was as an um, electrical circuit. Uh, there was a capac there, there is a capacitance, and there are some uh, two uh, variables, uh, conductances corresponding to fluxes of uh, sodium and potassium ions, and there's a leak, uh, and there's a leak uh, constant uh, resistance. They wrote uh, the equations of that circuit. Uh, v sub n is the difference uh, of potential between the inside and the outside of the neuron. 
I is the current, the total current, C is CM is the capacitance. And then we see uh, three terms which look very much alike, uh, corresponding to the uh, potassium, the sodium, and the leak. And uh, the terms in front are the uh, conductances of the corresponding channels, uh, and quote, and of quote, they, they didn't know at the time the, that the, these channels existed uh, physically. Well, they, they thought uh, they, they might exist, but uh, it hadn't been verified. So this, this is a differential equation that gives you the time variation of the membrane potential. And the functions N, M, H are um, functions of the membrane potential. Uh, we'll see that they can be, uh, they can be interpreted as uh, proportions of open or closed channels in the membrane. So the variables N, M, M, N and M are activation variables and H is an inactivation variable for the uh, sodium channel. It's more complicated here. You have an M cubed times H. Uh, I'll come back to this in, in a few slides. Uh, so these are, these are the uh, four dimensional. There are four equations, nonlinear because the, the functions alpha N and so on uh, are nonlinear functions of the membrane potential. So they are highly nonlinear uh, differential equations. That govern uh, that govern the very the time variation of the um, this is a space clamped. Uh, there's no propagation uh, along the axon. They just put an electrode in it to make sure that uh, nothing would uh, propagate, and uh, it's also uh, voltage clamped clamped uh, to actually make the measurements. So this is a this is what happens uh, maybe at the soma. But they also wrote the action potential propagation equation to which I will uh, come back in a, in, a, in a minute. Uh, so the action potential is a fairly simple and complicated but beautifully uh, tuned uh, phenomenon by which uh, this is the time, uh, this is the voltage, the membrane potential voltage. And uh, when you uh, when you inject a, a current around here, uh, what happens is that uh, the uh, sodium channels do activate, so the uh, uh, the M variable tends to increase, and uh, and that raises uh, that forces the membrane potential neuron to go toward the uh, this uh, voltage here. And uh, when it reaches the, close to this uh, value, then uh, the, the Na plus channel, the sodium channels inactivate, that's the H variable that decreases. And, and then you have this uh, decrease. I won't go into the details uh, of, uh, of this, but this is a very beautiful uh, picture and where uh, sodium and potassium channels uh, play, uh, uh, play a very delicate uh, dance. Uh, to produce this peak, uh, which is very short, a few milliseconds. And, uh, and that's the action potential that then travels in some cases along the axon of the neuron and hits, uh, and hits the, uh, the connection with other neurons. Uh, the, uh, the, as, I, as I said, the model is, uh, is very powerful because it can describe many different neuronal behaviors, which you can find among uh, other places in the beautiful book by Izikiewicz. So you can have these trains of spice corresponding to a periodic uh, solution of the equations. And then you have the tonic bursting, you have the spike frequency adaptation. There's a lot more, uh, maybe dozens of, of behaviors which can all be reproduced from by the equations, the hashing equations, or some of their uh, uh, modifications. Today's view is uh, slightly different. It's uh, an improvement on uh, the view of Hutchin and Huxley. Uh, people talk about ions and gates. Uh, so this is again from the book of Isikiewicz, where you have the in inside of the neuron, the outside, and uh, and, uh, and you see the different ion populations, sodium, potassium, uh, chloride, uh, calcium, we'll talk about calcium later. 
and uh, and uh, the channels that allow these ions to travel uh, in, inside from the inside to the outside or vice versa and we know now that uh, these ion channels are actually uh, big molecules which live on the uh, uh, <clears throat> on the neuron membrane for example the uh, sodium channel is a molecule with uh, four gates uh can i yeah there are four gates blue ye uh, yellow green and uh, maybe red uh, no sorry blue red and uh, blue yellow and green and uh, so these are activation gates and the little uh, ball here is the inactivation gate and the number as i said m and h these are the variables m and h from before M is the number of open uh, uh, open ch uh, channels, and H is the number of uh, inactivated or activated uh, channels. And uh, the conductance of the channel is actually the product of the maximum conductance by this uh, polynomial in M and H. Um, what's an important uh, observation, which I, I'll, I'll stress later, is that the uh, the ion channels are stochastic beasts therefore they can be represented uh, if we assume like uh, most of the time that they, they can be in a finite number of states they can represent they can be represented by a mark of chain with discrete number of states and uh, this is from a, a, a nice article by Destex and, and colleagues uh, where he shows the uh, the eight states of the sodium channel uh, with the transition functions alpha m and beta m. In uh, uh, this is the open state. This is the uh, this is the activation state, and uh, the acti the inactivation gate the the the, the ball is uh, in the open state uh, at top or closed at the bottom, and you have the transition probabilities. Uh, so basically, they did uh, they did uh, wonderful work, but uh, not very much mathematical analysis. Uh, they were more physiologists than mathematicians, but they did a lot of numerical simulations. Then their equations were uh, looked at a few years uh, later by uh, John Evans, uh, who looked at the uh, the class of equations. So these are deterministic equations. I'll go into stochastic later. Uh, he looked at the class of equations given by its uh, diffusion equation with a nonlinear source term. So V is the membrane potential. X is the uh, coordinate along the axis. So this is a linear uh, one-dimensional uh, neuron as, 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 as before. And the G sub I, the G sub zero is the equation, the first equation in the hashing Isley model. W1, Wn are various ion channels, and these are the uh, uh, channel variables, if you wish, the M, N, and H variables. So he looked at these equations from the from the from the theoretical viewpoint. 1970, he proved existence, uniqueness, and continuous dependence on initial values of the solutions of these equations. And then he also looked at the stability of the resting state, traveling pulse solutions, uh, propagation of the uh, action potential. Uh, he proved all this in uh, papers uh, published in uh, 72 and 75, uh, all in the Indiana uh, University Mathematical Mathematics Journal. And this is all, I, I insist, this is all deterministic. Uh, but this was important, an important uh, uh, analysis of the uh, PD uh, of uh, hodgkin oxley model. So what is the impact of the work on hodgkin oxley In physiology, it's clearly huge. I mean, it has changed the face of, uh, of, uh, of neuroscience uh, in the physiology labs. In mathematics, uh, I would say it's important in dynamic system analysis, uh, bifurcation theory. I have these two fine papers by Guckenheimer and collaborators. Um, this, uh, in this one, I think they prove uh, existence of chaos uh, in the solutions. And in this paper, they do a fairly complete analysis of uh, up to co-dimension two bifurcations of the uh, Hodgkin-Huxley uh, equations. 
And if you type bifurcations Hodgkin Nestle in Google Scholar, you get thousands of, uh, of uh, responses. So it's also important in math. Now, I will be talking about deriving the HH model in uh, ad initio from first principles. So that's, this is my third topic. So as I said, ion channels are stochastic. So how much does channel noise matter? Uh, is an important question, both physiological and mathematical. And it turned out uh, it took a long time to uh, come up with a mathematically precise analysis of this model when considered at several scales. Uh, the work of uh, T. Uh, Timothy, I think, Austin, 2008, built on the work by Kurtz and, and collaborators and Davis, and that was followed by Michelle Thielen and some of her collaborators, Pakdaman, Genado, Martin Riddler. Uh, they all came up with very fine analysis of the stochastic uh, nature of the Hutchin equation, equations. So I will talk about Austin's work uh, very, uh, very superficially. Uh, Austin thought about uh, the axon, thought of the axon as a linear uh, thing, uh, the uh, closed interval, interval minus one, uh, one. The axon state is described by its membrane potential, which is a function from this interval i into r. It's a Lipschitz and h zero one of i. So it's zero at both ends, that's the zero, and h1, it's um, it's Sobolev space, uh, the function itself, and its first order derivative are L square integral, R square, uh, the square R integrables. He assumed that all chain ion channels were, were identical. He assumed a finite set of uh, channels, a finite set of channel states called E, uh, you remember the reversal potential uh, for the sodium and the poten poten uh, potassium? He called them V Xi. Xi belongs to this uh, uh, set of uh, states. And uh, the transition at position X uh, from uh, state Xi to uh, state Zeta is, the, is given by the rate alpha Xi Zeta. So this is standard. Bear with me. Uh, and then he built a sequence of n stochastic models, which comprised uh, integer part of 2n minus 2 uh, channels at positions. So you look at the n times the interval, so it's minus n plus n. Uh, you intersect it with z, uh, and uh, you divide it by n, uh, the coordinates by n, and that gives you the positions of the channels. Uh, I zero is just the um, uh, the open the opening of the interval. This is the open uh, open interval minus one one. At each uh, at each point, the ion channel conductance is one over n c c, and uh, he denoted uh, by uh, uppercase c t of n to remind you that uh, it's the nth model which belongs to uh, E raised to the power, this uh, set of uh, numbers, integers. And that's the, the state of, that describes the state of all channels at time t, okay? He also needed uh, peak C of X, which is the proportion of those channels which are in state C or zeta or whatever in a neighborhood of X. So this is a, a long preliminary uh, description of the notations. I apologize for this. But then he wrote the equations uh, for the deterministic hodgkin Huxley equations, like, like hodgkin Huxley. So he said that uh, a continuous function from the uh, closed interval 0 to capital T, so it's a finite time interval, into h01 of i. I said what this was before and a family peak C of continuous function, which are which apply this same interval into the set of Lipschitz functions from the interval i into 0, 1. We say, or he said that uh, this was a solution to the deterministic hodgkin Huxley equation if the derivative is in this space. You may want to ask me what this is later, but this is not very important at this point. Uh, this is also uh, the, the time derivative of this function belongs to this uh, space. And he wrote the equations, which are 
the Hodgkin-Hux Lay equations. Uh, dt, v, d, dt, d, d, dvt dt equals Laplacian of vt plus uh, the, the, uh, the, 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 the channel uh, currents. This is the conductance. This is the number of channels, the proportion of uh, channels in the state C. Uh, this is the uh, reversal potential, and this is vt again. Okay, and this is just a conservation of mass equation for uh, P C of T, uh, which tells you that this is the sum over zeta, which are not equal to C in the set of possible space. The transition from zeta to C at the potential VT multiplied multiply by this, minus those uh, which change from C to zeta. And you have some initial and boundary conditions. Uh, at the end of the neuron, is, the potential is zero. Uh, this is the H01 uh, in mathematics. Okay, so these are the uh, deterministic. Now, this, now let's go to the stochastic. Alors, stochastic, sorry. Uh, stochastic, uh, we, we have to, to, to choose this uh, probability space, omega. There's a, there's a set of, um, uh, there's a sigma algebra. There's, uh, it's a fel uh, filtered, FT. Uh, perhaps the Brownian, and this is a uh, probability uh, distribution. So given this uh, probability space, a Cadillac continue à droite uh, uh, limit à gauche, uh, adapted process VT, CT, the pair uh, potential states, uh, such that V and CT are in the right spaces, which is expressed here. So we say that this, this pair of uh, processes adapted to the filtration to be a solution of the stochastic hodgkin huxley equations with initial conditions v naught for the potential c naught for the state if the following conditions are satisfied. Okay, uh, so first there is a condition on the regularity. Uh, the map T DTV is in the same space as before P almost surely, not always, but uh, with a very high probability, uh, equal to one actually. And if it satisfies uh, the potential, uh, the PDE, which is written here, uh, so you have the, uh, the Laplacian again, and you have the equivalent of the uh, channel current equations. And this is the conductance uh, this is the conductance uh, for the state I and the summation for all possible uh, states. This is the reversal potential. This is the value of the membrane potential at uh, coordinate I over N. And this is delta I over N. This is just a standard Dirac function, which uh, belongs to uh, H minus one here. And we want this equation to be satisfied, not always, but P almost surely, but for all T's, in zero t so that's the pde oops sorry and uh, you also have something to describe uh, some uh, condition to describe the jumps so the probability uh, at that at time t plus h uh, uh, and for uh, the state i is equal to zeta given the fact that uh, at time t it was c is given by, it's proportional to the uh, rate of change, alpha C zeta, multiplied by H, uh, the time H, uh, plus something small, which goes to zero uh, when H goes to zero. You have some conditional independence conditions, which I, I will not uh, uh, describe here, but you have the two uh, equations for the, the, the membrane potential and the transition states. You also have some initial conditions. And uh, he proved in a very uh, beautifully written paper, uh, the convergence result, i.e. Uh, if you give yourself, if you choose an epsilon positive, some initial conditions, then for any n sufficiently large, there exists an initial condition C naught for the stochastic Huxley equations such that, so that there is some high probability omega one included in omega, such that the probability of a omega minus omega one is less than epsilon, and such that 
the soup with respect to T of VT minus uh, capital VT minus uh, lowercase VT, which is the solution of the Hodgkin's equation, the norm being taken in H01 of I is less than epsilon. And uh, same thing for the uh, uh, same thing for the transition function. And this is true on omega one. Uh, I should say perhaps what uh, this function C C N of capital C is, is just the empirical measure for uh, the state C. So it's the sum over all I such that uh, Xi equal C, uh, capital Xi equal lowercase size of delta I over N. So this is a, a, a beautiful result. In words, it tells us that if N goes to infinity, the stochastic ion channel model of the axon, axon gives a time evolution of the potential difference along the axon that converges in probability to that, to that given by the deterministic model uniformly up to a given finite time horizon. That's the soup over, soup over T. So this is a very, very nice result. Uh, the model has actually three scales, individual ions, which are which both models are blind to, ion channels and whole axon. The stochastic model is faithful to the second, uh, at the second and third scales. Uh, it uses a very simplified behavior at the smallest scales, the individual ions. It's just the uh, continuum charge distribution evolving in time according to a PDE. And it averages over the random behavior at the smallest scale. Smallest scale. The difference between the stochastic and deterministic model is one of resolution. As I said, neither model uh, can see the in individual ions, but the stochastic model can see single channels, uh, whereas the deterministic model can, cannot see them. This work was extended very nicely by Pakdaman, Tiolen, and Wayne Rib in the, the, their 2010 paper in the space claimed case, so no propagation. And by Riedler, Tiolen, and Wayne Rib uh, in the 2012 paper in the space extended case. So to describe the, they describe the fluctuations of the stochastic model around the limit. That's an improvement with respect to uh, uh, Austin's. Uh, they proved functional central limit theorems uh, that gave her a description of the fluctuations uh, for large ends. As written here, uh, there were two important innovations uh, with respect to uh, uh, Austin's work. The use of Markov jump processes coupled to an OD or PDE. So that's the uh, famous piecewise deterministic Markov processes, PDMPs, alias PDMPs, that were described in uh, nice papers by Davis and Worms in the 80s. So what's the impact of this work? In physiology, I would say it's significant. Uh, for example, we understand much better the importance of fluctuations or noise on the neural encoding. Uh, it introduced a rigorous statement treatment of noise in neuroscience. Uh, for example, then there's two nice papers by Will, uh, Willem Stanat in 2013 and 2015, where he uh, described the stability uh, and the fluctuations of the solutions to the stochastic nerve equations. In mathematics, uh, the work was important also. Uh, we have now new theorems on, say, PDMPs, uh, broadly speaking. I will now talk about two subjects which are uh, not very well covered in mathematical neuroscience. And I think they might be important. I don't know. Uh, but I'm just throwing the ideas around. Maybe people will tell me, ah, it's been done a long time ago. But let's look at effactic uh, interactions. You know the connectome. The connectome is uh, a, a, an outcome, an output of DTI, DTI, diffusion tensor imaging. Grossly speaking, very quickly, it allows to recover bundles of uh, axons in the brain at a resolution of one millimeter. So roughly 1,000 axons in the bundle. Here you have a, a very nice uh, view of some uh, such uh, bundles in, in the brain, the corpus callosum. This is a human brain. Uh, the corpus callosum is here. This is the, uh, okay, different parts. Uh, 
So what is effective interaction? It comes from a Greek uh, word, uh, which I'm not sure I understand very well. I never learned uh, ancient Greek. Uh, but basically, uh, it tells us that axons, which are close to one another, may uh, exchange signals without, uh, without using, uh, without using uh, uh, synapses. OK, so that, that tells us that axons may talk to each other uh, without uh, being directly connected through a, a synapse. Uh, this was this fact was uh, flagged, uh, was mentioned by in this uh, 1940 paper by Katz and Schmidt. Uh, and uh, there was a recent paper by uh, Hiba Shehitli uh, and Victor uh, Giza, Giza in 2020 paper in which they looked, uh, they had to first look at this phenomenon. So you are, these are two axons. You have uh, resistances uh, everywhere, uh, uh, um, capacitances. Um, I will not go into the details. Uh, this, this is simple electricity, if, if I may say so. Uh, and so if I call V1, the membrane potential of the first neuron, V2, the membrane potential of the second neuron, Z is, the, uh, is, is here. Uh, they were able to uh, derive two uh, coupled PDEs, uh, V1, V2, and they are coupled. Well, they are coupled not always. Uh, if you look at the value of the coefficient alpha, it's given by the ratio of uh, R sub E. R sub E is the resistivity of the outside uh, uh, of the neurons. And if this resistivity is equal to zero, there's no possible uh, crosstalk between the neurons. So they're not coupled and alpha equals zero and the two neurons are independent. But if it's non-zero, then there is coupling. Uh, G, J, sorry, J, I, N, one and two are the, uh, uh, are given actually in their work by the uh, Fitzek-Nagumo model. Uh, so you have uh, the membrane potential and the adaptation variable. Uh, and as you know, Fitzek-Nagumo is a reduction of the hodgkin gasly model. Okay, so um, for n axons, the resulting equation is this one. So you have a summation over all axons, uh, axons, sorry, or, or all neurons. This is the pth one. F is the Fitzek-Nagumo uh, function, and uh, IP is the uh, uh, the injected current, uh, if if any. And this is the uh, slow uh, adaptation variable. And R is the membrane potential of the, uh, sorry, R is the ratio of uh, R sub A uh, and R sub E, external resistance and axon resistance. So again, uh, if uh, R sub E is equal to zero, uh, R is very large and there's no, there's no coupling. But uh, if R sub E is, uh, is large, uh, then you have uh, R is big R, capital R is uh, small and you have uh, coupling. So let me briefly describe uh, a few results they have in their paper. All these picture, figures are taken from, from, from their paper. Uh, so in this figure, uh, we see uh, four columns. Uh, we see four columns. And uh, on the column A, uh, the, so we have 15 neurons. That's the vertical axis, uh, 15 neurons. And time runs along the horizontal axis. Maybe you can read what's, read what's uh, underneath the figure. But basically, uh, uh, on col in column A, uh, neurons uh, 30 and 20, which are, this is neuron 25, are stimulated at time 0 and times 10. And, uh, and, uh, and the, the value of capital R is fairly large, is 0.8. So you see the propagation, nothing, nothing, nothing interesting uh, happens. In B, uh, column B, it's uh, neurons 24 and 25, which are closer than the uh, neurons are on the line here. Uh, and nothing much happens also. Uh, well, they do, they do fuse uh, their, 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 uh, their activity. Uh, C, column C is, uh, is the same, but uh, different types of simulations. And column D is uh, the same as A, but with a larger, uh, smaller value of capital R, stronger coupling. And you see now that uh, 
there is there's something happens in between the neurons and uh, something interesting which will become even more interesting in, in this figure here uh, where basically I, I will not get into the details but uh, we decrease the value of capital r that is we increase the coupling between the neurons and you see some very interesting patterns uh, appearing even some uh, some action potentials that go that uh, run in the backward direction in the reverse direction they go to uh, in the reverse they don't propagate only from the left to the right but also from the left to the right and there is a strong coupling and then this is even more uh, r is equal to 0.05 so they, they, they say in the paper that uh, for uh, biologically plausible values of R, you do have uh, couplings. So what's next? I think it's an interesting uh, subject. Uh, more physiological checking is required to understand this better. More modeling is to be done. Uh, they don't have any myelin. Uh, they don't have nodes of Ranvier. They don't have ion channels. They don't have any noise. And from the mathematical point of view, everything remains to be done in my opinion uh, they did a nice uh, physical typical physical analysis physics analysis they wrote down the equations and they run simulations that, but they prove close to nothing now uh, my uh, last subject before the conclusion is uh, glial cells uh, christophe bear with me uh, christophe Pouza. so forgotten glial cells uh, we have eight, well, roughly these numbers, uh, 80, 85 billion of neurons in the human brain, and we have more than 100 billion of glial cells uh, as, uh, as uh, reviewed in the paper, 2009 paper by Herculano uh, uh, Rousel paper. Uh, there are three categories uh, of uh, glial cells. Uh, microglia, I won't talk about it, I know close to nothing. Oligodendrocytes, dendrocytes, dendrocytes, myelin, that's what's wrapping around the, the neurons to make the uh, action potentials travel faster. And the astrocytes, uh, which are uh, extremely important, apparently, uh, as I will try and show. This is a picture, a drawing from the hand of Yves Agid and from their book, his book with, uh, I forgot the first name, Magistretti. Uh, there are two uh, neurologists, French neurologists, who published the book. I will uh, and this is drawn uh, after Ramon I Cajal. Uh, and you can see uh, this neuron here. He's uh, not attacked, but he's surrounded by astrocytes, these uh, strange cells here, which I repeat are not neurons, but uh, are important apparently. And uh, uh, the, play, the play on words or the, the joke is uh, you, maybe some of you have read the book by Changeux, The Neural Man, Neuronal Man from the 70s. And uh, they claim that uh, we should talk about glial or at least glial and neuronal man instead of just neuronal man. And uh, there's several reasons which I, I will list here. Uh, the uh, the uh, neurotransmitter, the glutamate, uh, evokes calcium. Calcium is the key, uh, the key thing here. Uh, it evokes calcium concentration rises in astrocytes. This was uh, noticed by Korn and Bell, a, a, a colleagues and colleagues in 1990s. So calcium, Ca2+, uh, this signaling, the fact that it raises or decreases, can propagate along astrocytic processes and even between glial cells as waves. There are very nice spiral waves uh, uh, among glial cells. Uh, these glial cells, uh, Ca2+, plus, or calcium waves, might constitute an extraneuronal signaling system in the CNS. And uh, the increases in cytosolic, it's a fluid that comprises cytoplasm, in cytosolic uh, calcium concentration of astrocytes, could regulate the release of neuroactive molecules, not only the uh, action potentials, but also the calcium uh, released by the astrocytes. And all these are uh, very detailed and important uh, uh, experimental observation led to the idea that astrocytes uh, are powerful regulators of neural spiking, synaptic plasticity, and cerebral blood flow. They help uh, nourish, feed the, the neurons. 
look at this picture also from uh, uh, the book by Agid and Magistretti. Uh, this is a very nice metaphor. Uh, this is, these are two avenues in Paris bordered by uh, buildings. And these are two neurons uh, or <laughs> yeah, two neurons, let's say two neurons, uh, which are uh, surrounded by astrocytes. And Agide and Magistretti uh, say, okay, suppose uh, we, are, we are sitting on a distant planet and we have a nice uh, telescope and we look at Paris. They love Paris. I don't know why, but they love Paris. And, uh, and they see cars uh, moving around uh, these avenues and they say, aha, these uh, avenues uh, uh, transmit information. Okay. And the same here, action potentials are, are measured and they transmit information. But can you describe the intellectual life of Paris just by the cars that run through it uh, on its avenues? Maybe some important decisions are made in the buildings and the buildings are the astrocytes. I love this metaphor. So uh, that's what they say. Uh, we, we, should, we should look more closely at uh, glial cells. And uh, as I said, they are electrically uh, passive, uh, but the calcium that they, they use uh, could be an effective code for stimulus representation, interpretation, transformation, and transmission. Moreover, and for many of us, uh, who like uh, stochastic calculus or stochastic analysis, uh, this signaling is very, very stochastic. So there's a lot of interesting work to be done. So the roles of these glial cells as described in this book, which has not yet been translated into another language than French, uh, l'homme glial, the glial man, uh, is a source of energy. They're a source of energy for neurons. They talk to uh, blood vessels and to neurons as well. They participate in the communication between all neural cells. They control synapse formation and creation of new neurons. And they seem to be, that's their claim, building up some of our uh, behaviors. I'll go quickly through a very simple model that was uh, proposed in uh, two years ago by Stimberg, Goodman, Brett, and uh, De Pita. Uh, Okay, so this, uh, this is an artist's view of the inside of a, of a cell. Uh, the cytosol I was talking about is 11, number 11, this liquid here. Plastic reticulum, there's the rough and the smooth. It's number five, uh, this is number eight, and number five is, this is, that's the rough one. Okay, so what do these people say? They say that the intracellular calcium concentration is regarded as a prominent readout uh, signal of astrocyte activity. Fine. Then CICR, calcium-induced uh, calcium release from the astrocyte's endoplasmic reticulum, that's the one here, ER, appears to be one of the main mechanisms. Okay, so we I, they identify the main mechanisms that should enter the models. And astrocytic CICR is triggered by the intracellular second messenger, inositol 145. It's hard for me to pronounce all this. Let's call it IP3. All right, so having identified the main mechanisms, uh, they wrote a model. And the model is basically a, a slightly or a modified uh, Hodgkin Huxley uh, model. Uh, their particular model is uh, the one by Lee and Rinsel. Uh, I'll, I'll show you a slide in a few in a few in a few minutes. Lee and Rinsel in 1984. So the first equation, this one, sees the calcium concentration uh, in the astrocyte, uh, and it's a mass balance between three fluxes: J sub R, C I C R, the leak from E R. Uh, to, uh, from ER, that's GL, uh, and JP, uh, JL, sorry, and JP is the uptake from the cytosol back to the ER. So it's just a mass, uh, a mass balance. The second equation, you recognize it, it's a mass, uh, it's a deinactivation of the channels, which are responsible for CICR. So it's the usual DHDT that we had before. Note that as in the hodgkin huxley model, JR, JL, and JP are nonlinear functions of the calcium concentration and the IP3I. So the two main variables are C and I. 
Then they write uh, an IP3I uh, equation, which is also a mass balance equation, which I will not, uh, I will not discuss in details. Uh, what's important is gamma survey, maybe, is the activated fraction of astrocytic uh, receptors, uh, which starts the I or IP3 uh, production. Okay, so usual equations, and, and this is, uh, this is a, an equation similar to the equations of the H variable. So, as a conclusion, I went very briefly without any details, but what's important is that uh, you see that in this model, which is one of the most advanced today, as of today, uh, of astrocytes uh, calcium uh, regulation, if you wish, the dynamics of the astrocyte state variables, gamma sub A, I, C, and H, are governed by ODEs, which are very much like normal state variables, although it's much slower uh, than in, in, uh, in normals. And here is a simulation which uh, all the figures are taken from this article uh, by uh, Stimberger et al. So this is the model uh, uh, they, they use. Uh, so two neurons, the source neuron, the target neurons, this uh, synapse, spikes. Uh, this is the neurotransmitter in the extrasynaptic space that triggers the, uh, uh, the changes in uh, calcium in the astrocyte. And uh, so uh, so this is the, the variable gamma sub A. So the variable gamma sub A varies with uh, the arrival of action potentials here at the synapse. Uh, I think it's 0.5 hertz, uh, but it doesn't matter. Uh, OK, I'm, so, I'm sorry. I forgot to say that uh, there, there were two, uh, that there were two um, astrocytes here. One is deterministic, the H variable, which you remember, one is deterministic and the other one is stochastic. And stochastic is very elementary. They just add uh, a white noise to the equation. And what you see is uh, the time variation of the uh, IP3, the calcium concentration, and the H variable. And you can see that noise seems to be very, very important. Uh, the curves are very, very, uh, very different. And this is a hint uh, as to uh, Toward uh, what I will say in a few in a few slides, I'm, I'm almost finished. Uh, this is a very nice picture, which you probably cannot uh, cannot uh, decipher. Uh, this is taken from a, a remarkable paper by uh, Tina Maninen, uh, Rika Havela, and Marsha. She, she's the boss. Uh, 19, 2019 paper. They did a wonderful survey of all models of astrocytes and uh, interaction between astrocytes and and, and 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 neurons and it all starts from the model of um, let's say Rinzel it out and and then they track they tracked uh, all <laughs> all uh, children of this uh, model so this is a very rich source of, uh, of information for those of you who would be interested in looking at these models and now the question is uh, where to go? Well, I suggest that to read the two books, five or 600 pages each, uh, by Paul Breslov, uh, Stochastic Processes in Cell Biology, and the book by Depita and Barry, from which uh, the figures you just saw uh, were, were, were taken. And uh, there's a lot of biology to learn. I'll come back to this in a few slides. And uh, interesting biology, but as I, as I was telling you, the math vastly remained to be done. Uh, and also uh, the, the thing, uh, they, uh, they don't model networks a little bit uh, when they talk about waves, uh, calcium waves. But uh, for those of you who know about neural fields, uh, neural fields uh, with the glial cells uh, have never been analyzed, except in this chapter by, in, in this book by where Brett uh, and colleagues uh, do uh, numerical simulations of a network composed of neurons and, uh, and astrocytes. But really, it's it's a huge area where where many mathematicians should uh, start working. So to conclude, topics I haven't had time to cover. Sorry, uh, I was. Uh, it, it's better that I didn't cover them because my time is up. 
So plasticity learning and astrocytes seem to be important, perhaps very important uh, there. Models of cortical areas, uh, like neural fields. I said uh, I was going to be talking about geometry. That's where the geometry hides itself. Uh, and mean fields models of populations of neurons, where it's a little bit like the initial model of uh, Austin's to recover the hodgkin nestle equations, except you do this with uh, millions of neurons and try to summarize the activity of this, of this uh, network with uh, a few mean field equations. Missile uh, and I think it's my last slide. Uh, what I'm saying here, uh, yes, the, the, the first point, uh, in physics, uh, you can grasp, uh, grab an equation and go away with it and try to understand solutions. You take the equations of uh, uh, general relativity and, uh, and you crunch them. Uh, you don't have to redo the general relativity uh it's often unescapable for a mathematician uh to 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 have to learn you have to learn the the biology and and do the model write down the model in many cases so that's something uh unusual uh the interacting with experimentalists uh to me it's it's sometimes very difficult uh, but uh, some people may contradict me. It's important, of course, but I found that the uh, cultural gap between mathematicians and uh, biologists is, is huge. Uh, biologists tend to know little mathematics, uh, unlike in physics, where, where experimental physicists uh, do know a lot of uh, mathematics, so it's probably easier. But again, uh, these are uh, ideas. Uh, now, what about computational neuroscientists? Uh, the border uh, is, is, is sometimes hard to draw, but they do, uh, they do not prove theorems. So that's the border, that's the hard border. Uh, so computational neuroscientists is important. It's important to talk to them. And again, <laughs> I find it uh, a little bit sometimes difficult because uh, they blindly trust computer simulations. Uh, and uh, from these computer simulations, when they acquire this uh, reasonable certainty that uh, Popper would uh, would dismiss, then they're happy. Uh, but for mathematicians, it's not sufficient, uh, and we have to go uh, to go further and try to prove things in detail. I have a question regarding the stochastic aspect in the in the. Um, uh, in the ion channels. Maybe we published a paper a few years ago where we studied uh, precisely this aspect. Uh, roughly judging that at the, at the, when the membrane potential has a certain level, the the mm, there's a time constant related to the opening of the channels. In, in that particular case, for 17 microseconds, plus minus something. And uh, so, do you? Uh, you didn't mention the word time constant, but but certainly it is it is somewhere there. Um, could you comment on on studies, mathematical studies of time constants in neurons? There are many of them in 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 in, in the stochastics, uh, in the, in the membrane time constant, and the whole neuron has time constant. Yeah, it's true also for the uh, uh, for the astrocytes, the interaction with astrocytes, uh, which are much, uh, much larger uh, time constants. Uh, yes, uh, in, in fact, I, I didn't, I didn't stress, uh, stress it, but uh, the time constants was present in the, uh, in the uh, H equations or for the, uh, for the M, N and H uh, equa equations they, they, some of them are faster some of them are uh, slower uh, so indeed this plays a role and uh, there's an in interesting they play they play a role and uh, perhaps uh, in some cases uh, you can draw uh, you can use the uh, the theory of slow fast systems where you have uh, very different uh, time scales and you can summarize the fast equations uh, 
and uh, uh, and and assume that the variables are basically constant they they use there uh, so in, in terms of noise you can also uh, there, there's a theory of uh, slow fast uh, stochastic differential equations and uh, slow fast uh, uh, partial differential equations uh, where uh, for example the, the phenomena of metamerism uh, is uh, amenable to uh, such an analysis uh, where you you stay for some time you know the the the, the, the work of Fredin and Wenzel it's I've talked a lot about uh, these uh, these aspects where you, you stay a long time in a basin of attraction of the dynamical system and then the noise uh, will pull you out of the basin and you go into another basin and understanding uh, how often you jump and uh, and how often you don't jump uh, all these are uh, as you as you pointed out in your question uh, very important aspects uh, which uh, i unfortunately didn't have time to uh, uh, to cover but uh, i'm not aware of your paper i, I, I wrote down the, <laughs> a note to uh, look it up uh, and i will uh, you have presented the work of iba and uh... You present the, the work really rapidly, but I the guess. work was uh, in order to quantify the effect of cap junction. So the idea is uh, is to correct, in fact, the behavior of the neuron by the the the, the I would say the influence of the glia cells. Of course, it's really important, but what what show this work? It's the, how to to prepare the mats for the gap junction so this is what i, I think uh, the, the the main result of the the hiba work if i remember co correctly yeah what do you think what do you think of that well i i, I don't know uh, but when i talk to people working in the, in dti uh, you know uh, constructing connectome and uh, i brought uh, brought up the uh, the question of uh, you know what should we do uh, because they okay they they do uh, they use this connectome to uh, to to make models of transmission of uh, uh, information between the different uh, uh, brain areas and uh, when I told them that there might be some crosstalks between the fibers uh, that would change the uh, the signals uh, arriving to the second or the target uh, brain area, they said, ah, oh, that's very interesting, but uh, we don't know how to take this into account in our models. So they were interested in this idea of uh, uh, of crosstalks between uh, uh, be between the between axons. Yes. But that's exactly what we would like to do. Yes, I'm sure you are. <laughs> I'm sure you are. Yeah, I think it's an important area to work to uh, to work in. Uh, there's something they did in their paper, which I didn't have to mention. Uh, they did a mean field analysis also. They they assumed that the number of uh, neurons in the bundle uh, grew to infinity, and they came up with uh, some nice uh, mean field equations. Uh, you know, describing what happens, uh, describing what happens when the number of neurons in the fiber grows large. Uh, we saw uh, that the number of fibers is about thousand at the current DTI resolution. So it, this might be uh, amenable to uh, to the uh, mean field equations, and certainly to an analysis of the fluctuations of the uh, of the deterministic equation or the uh, finite size. Uh, solutions with respect to the uh, mean field limit and i think all these are very exciting subjects which are very much worth uh, uh, looking into it was really fantastic talk especially for a non-expert uh, like uh, like me but because i'm greek i thought i should uh, ah. offer my <laughs> my some information about the word so epopsis means touch in in greek and i think the author of the paper that i mentioned uh, this very old paper 1942 c coined yes. this term uh -huh. and then of course there is some etymological connection uh -huh. Uh -huh. tangential epoptic is tangential actually so there's a touch point in any case by contrast to synaptic which is a joining point uh -huh. yeah very interesting <laughs> well anyway thank you again uh, you said uh, physicists uh, 
do something and Bruno said physicists also look for principles okay so I, I guess <laughs> but then he, he, he wrote astrocytes do not spike so dealing with an effective code associated to astrocytes would mean a completely different notion of code as the one we use with spikes bits of information here the code would correspond to something analogic, isn't it? I like the idea. So that was Bruno comment. Do you like to, to comment on it? He's right to the point. Uh, it's, it, it has to be a very different uh, code uh, that the astrocytes uh, are using if, if they're using. Uh, the, the astrocyte encoding must be very different and uh, it has to be uh, closer to uh, something. It has to be uh, uh, analog than, than uh, digital as in the case of uh, action potentials yes, yes. Bruno is, uh, is always right uh, he's my next door neighbor at inria so uh, we talk to each other often and uh, exchange yes he's right concerning the effective uh, interactions there, there's a fairly large literature that is um, reviewed uh, at least in a book by uh, alwin scott from 2002 uh, the title of the book is uh, Neuroscience and Mathematical Primer, and he yeah. has a chapter, uh, 20 long pages, 20 pages long chapter, where he, he discusses, at, uh, among other things, the way you get synchronization. I mean, spikes traveling at the same speed when you get, uh, you start with axons of different diameters, so the, the yeah. Yeah. isolated, you would have two different speeds, but when you, you get the effective interaction, they, 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 they lock. Which was, and uh, he reviews also the, the exponential literature uh, yeah. of that. Um, and now, yeah, concerning the, the, the glial cells, um, <laughs> two, two, two points uh, in my view, and I could be totally wrong, of course. Um, we should try to distinguish what is information, information processing from what is. Uh, the requirement for biological cells to 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 keep working, um, and for me, it's not always clear when uh, glial cell people uh, uh, present their results. Uh, what is uh, I mean? That's absolutely clear that you, you need you need the glial cells to keep to keep your your brain cells uh, in a working state. Um, what is not as clear is uh, their role in, in information processing, especially if you consider that uh, and the main job of the brain is to do things fast. Um, the, 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 the last point, uh, when you, you um, mentioned that the, in the simple model you, you presented with CICR, uh, the nonlinear part looked like uh, machine and XLA, um, equations. Um, the, the issue here uh, is these experiments are very difficult. You, you can't re record uh, the, the, the calcium concentration as easily as you can record uh, membrane uh, currents. And so the, the, the whole question is, do people use uh, oceanously like equations because they, they are used to them and they are compatible with, uh, let's say, noisy data, or is it really like that? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When, uh, when you're a trained physiologist, you've, you've gone through the ocean acid equation, so uh, the easiest thing to do when you meet a new, a new phenomenon is to try to, 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 to fit uh, an equation of the same kind to what you see. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And given the these experiments are really difficult mm. and very noisy, so it's, it's, it's mm. hard to, to tell what is the, uh, the easy way of modeling from the, the underlying reality. Well, that's very interesting. That means uh, that uh, uh, people, uh, in, I mean, we, we uh, as mathematicians and, and, and other physicists and, and biologists, of course, should uh, try and uh, reconsider the equations that describe the behavior of astrocytes. Uh, and, uh, and maybe come up with different equations. That's one of your suggestions. Maybe they don't uh, operate uh, as uh, as the Hutchinus Lake commands. I, I don't know, uh, uh, but th that's certainly an interesting uh, topic of, 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 of investigation. 
uh, this there seemed to be a Of course, the time constants are very—they're very slow. The gliad cells are very slow, and uh, but apparently they, they might play a role in uh, long-term memory uh, processes, uh, as I think you you, you mentioned. Uh, and uh, these are processes that are poorly understood, as far as I know. Uh, what do you think? Right. Yes. Yeah, I, I agree. I agree. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, to me, uh, you know, I discovered this field uh, to, uh, when I prepared this talk. I didn't want to talk about things I knew, uh, only about things I, I knew everything of. And uh, I discovered this field about two months ago. And uh, I, I think it's very much worth uh, for mathematicians going into it. It's, it. it's an investment, but I think it's worth it. Perhaps worth uh, checking also is the muscle uh, physiology literature, because you have very similar and, and role for calcium uh, yeah. in contraction. Yeah. And it's much easier to do the measurements in muscles. So models are much more advanced. I see. Yeah. And so yeah, yeah. it's also yeah. worth checking first this uh, muscle physiology literature and then try to to, to combine it with what is, is yeah. doing. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, I saw. I, uh, I didn't write it in the slide, but I, I bumped into a, a, a large review on on, on calcium uh, calcium waves in all sorts of tissues. Uh, I forgot the name of the author, but I have it somewhere. Uh, that looked very well documented and important to read. Yeah. Uh, so I was just wondering, reading your your the first sentence of your last slide, uh, if you could <laughs> a bit. Uh, go a bit further in the difference you make between a physicist and a mathematician. And uh, I was under the impression that physicists uh, tend to also be uh, careful about biology. So uh, what is it to understand there uh, that I'm missing? Thank you. Uh, yeah, well, no, I, I, I didn't mean, I didn't intend to say that physicists don't have to be careful about biology. Uh, uh, they, 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 they have to, just as uh, mathematicians. Uh, the thing is that uh, there's few models, or not enough models, maybe, or, yeah, in, in, in neuroscience. So my, my point was that uh, in physics, uh, which is a very much more well-established field, a mathematician can choose the equation of his choice and, and work on it without worrying about the model or the, the, the physic, uh, physical theory, almost. But uh, in neuroscience, uh, both physicists and mathematicians and mathematicians have to worry about models. And therefore, if you worry about models, you have to read and learn the biology. 